Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is David Piatkowski, and I, with Renzo Garini, will be chairing this session. And just in the last 10 minutes, we've had many rapid uh, technological improvements in this meeting. Number one, this device advances the slides. <laughs> so green is to go forward a slide, and red is to go back. Number two, we have a pointer that works. <laughs> Number three, your talk will be on this monitor down here, so you don't have to crane around and look back while you're trying to speak to the audience. And number four, there is water here in case you're thirsty during your talk. So um, now having said all that. Um, oh, actually, number five, do not touch these microphones. <laughs> no matter what, they make a terrible sound. Um, so uh, with, with all of that, I'd now like to introduce my co-chair, Renzo Garini, who is going to give us an introduction to genetics and epilepsy, and then also present on the DESIRE project. But we'll, yeah, it's complicated. We have to use two hands, huh? <laughs> so, um, good morning. I will uh, use a few slides to introduce the topic of epilepsy genetics, also in the perspective of the clinical side, and not just the research side, and then uh, present some paradigmatic results of studies, not just from DESIRE, but from the community, to exemplify some problems to be addressed. And then some of these problems will be addressed in the fall. Num <laughs> okay. Number four. Just great. <laughs> okay. So, uh, right hand. Okay. Now, the situation of the research and clinical diagnostics in the domain of epilepsy genetics can be introduced and summarized by this slide, where uh, we know that at September 2017, there were 57 genes described in association with the severe epilepsies and the epileptic encephalopathies. Uh, these genes did not just cause single disorders, some of them caused multiple disorders. And if you look, for example, if you look into the catalog of human Mendelian diseases for, uh, uh, for example, using the keywords early epileptic encephalopathy, you have more than 6,000 6, entries. So they account for a considerable number of disorders. Now, what is the situation in the clinical dimension? Well, uh, reviewing the 13 main um, NGS studies on the epilepsies, which are not homogeneous, most of them contain indications on the epileptic encephalopathies. Uh, some have included other conditions as well. You see that the rate of positive cases considering panels and exomes is now about 40%. If you stay just on panels, you have 35%. And if you look the distributions of mutations according to genes, you see, for example, that the uh, cluster of SCN1A, 2A, and 8A, they account for 37% of the positive cases, which means that the remaining 65% is captured in the, within the remaining 54 genes, which means that each gene is responsible for a very limited number of uh, diagnoses. The situation uh, hasn't advanced much in the domain of the uh, common epilepsies, the idiopathic generalized epilepsies, namely, where you know uh, and a genetic basis has always been inferred based on the familiar distribution, often of different uh, subsyndromes. But in spite of all these advances, at, at present, none of the gene mutations which has been identified in monogenic epilepsies appears to confer any substantial effect to genetic variants of common epilepsies. So research is trying to clarify this 
but the efforts haven't brought much results. Now, uh, there is a, a certain number of these uh, proteins which have been associated with epilepsy, which are summarized in this slide. Um, there are many missing, but just to give you an idea of the heterogeneity, we have additional molecules, we have uh, ion channels, different enzymes, kinases, uh, ligand-dependent nuclear receptor, uh, spectrins, for example, or uh, many genes related to the mTOR pathway, transporters, genes uh, which are involved with uh, vesicle release or vesicle acidification. So there is a great heterogeneity. What is the consequence of this great heterogeneity? That there are different models to study the functional consequences of the mutations, uh, but these models uh, always have problems. For example, this is the uh, very important paper by uh, Cattrall with Massimo Mantegazza and others, which identified the expression of SN1A mutations with consequences in the GABA energy in the neurons as the primary cause of the uh, syndrome, lack of inhibition. And then, of course, uh, it is interesting to see what happens in iPSC cells. Uh, iPS cells uh, provided a different response because they also uh, demonstrated that there, was, uh, in, there were increased sodium currents both in bipolar and parameter-shaped neurons. So even when we can use the uh, human cells, the cells coming from uh, a disease patient, the results may not be in line what we would expect from... What's, what's that? Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, almost there. <laughs> what I would expect from... Oh, goodness. Uh, from previous knowledge. Now, I'm finishing. Uh, this is the uh, Elbig uh, who, uh, picture here. Uh, the logarithmic increase of the number of genes which have been associated with epilepsies, especially these severe epilepsies. And this is the curve of drug development, which has a similar shape. The pity is that these two curves seem never to be uh, destined to cross each other because drug development follows its own rules and it is drug development for epilepsies in general. It doesn't take into any account the specific etiologies and pathophysiologies of epilepsies. So this is a major drawback which will need to be addressed. So in conclusion, the impacts uh, of improved clinical and research uh, drone knowledge in the genetics of epilepsies certainly uh, is uh, Practically, practically seizable. Uh, we know the pre predictive value of genetic findings associated with specific entities, so we no longer think in some conditions uh, just in terms of syndrome, so we know the specific uh, genetic basis. So the collection of outcomes is much more homogeneous. Uh, there is a reduced need for further diagnostic investigation, of course, if you have a diagnosis, you don't need to do any more investigations. And in, uh, in association to improve prognostication, you have genetic counseling, which is very important, and a few options, as uh, we will see afterwards, of uh, uh, targeted treatment, which are still very limited, number seven, very limited. There are many gaps. Uh, in about two-thirds of the genetic epilepsy specific cause is, uh, remains undiagnosed. Uh, and these include all the common epilepsies and a, a large number of rare conditions. Uh, many different functional models are necessary to explore the underlying pathophysiology. And it, overall, the evidence from molecular pathology to epileptogenesis is hard to obtain. So when we need of devising anti-epileptogenic drugs, this is a major drawback. And uh, in general, if we go into the political and healthcare uh, policy, transition to precision medicine treatment is underfunded and slow and often remains impossible. So this is the end of the introductory talk. And then I was asked to provide another talk, actually with uh, 
uh, Jamin Chely. So I will have a few more slides. Um, it is important in the clinical dimension to think that all these uh, genetic discoveries uh, have brought about uh, important new uh, clinical concepts. Uh, we have uh, the large framework of the channelopathies, which represent uh, a relatively homogeneous category in spite of the variable phenotypes and severities. Certainly, they represent a model for uh, neurophysiology and possibly new drug development. Then we have uh, other entities like, for example, the female-limited intellectual disability and the epilepsy syndrome with protocadering. Um, we have uh, better characterized a large number of early onset metabolic syndromes, some of which are remediable by early treatment. Uh, now we have, uh, we know uh, from the very clinical presentation of small children having infantile spasms, uh, often accompanied by dyskinetic manifestations and uh, some uh, peculiar uh, behavioral phenotypes that they belong to the so-called red-like uh, uh, spectrum, CDKL5, FOXG1. So these is, diagnoses are made much earlier. The large uh, area of the amteropathies is very important, and this is uh, much studied in different labs, and has a very important clinical dimension, even for the focal epilepsies, which certainly uh, we don't know much about the genetics of. Uh, some concepts of progressive and non-progressive are being reshaped based on genetic knowledge, and uh, certainly there is some uh, there are some insights for personalized treatment. So, in practical terms, our clinical reasoning is changing. We move from the general framework description of uh, syndromes like West syndrome, infantile spasms, or Lennox Gastaut, or uh, the migrating uh, focal seizures to specific genes which are listed here. And this provides a much more specific uh, area of uh, intervention for the clinical dimension. Uh, there is a, a, a very important overlap between clinical um, algorithms, research, clinical diagnostic algorithms and research. Uh, for example, MRI addresses towards genetic studies in the areas of uh, malformations of cortical development or towards progressive neurological disorders or if it is negative to the specific genetic epilepsies. And this might provide a filter and a diagnosis in a large number of patients. And then if it doesn't, we need uh, well exon sequencing, which is done either at a clinical or a research level, and data are accumulated for research and then re-examined over time. And this is the reason why uh, so successful have been different projects. Epicure started to collect samples and these samples, uh, Olga Lersch perhaps will tell it, are then being reused and restudied in the EPI-25 consortium initiative. And these are as collected samples, and these samples have been studied in the REST initiative as well, and vice versa. So this is uh, uh, really a mass effect of this uh, consortium, which is very important in the genetic research. Now, just three examples to conclude. Uh, to see how the collaborations are essential because we are working in the domain of rare conditions. This is a recent paper uh, we uh, produced uh, within the activities of DESIRE. We collected initially four patients in different parts of the world, from Italy, Japan, Turkey, and the United States. And uh, together with the team of uh, Fabio Benfenati and Anna Fascio, who are other partners of DESIRE, uh, an experimental model was designed. So the impression of pathogenicity, which derived from the study of these characteristics of these mutations, was then validated with functional studies. And uh, we then published the paper, were convinced of this, and because these were no longer uh, confidential data, we went into gene matcher, and within a month, we found another 18 patients. 
And these patients are not being diagnosed because the same gene causes a recessive disorder, which is called cutis laxa, which is different from the one we have described. And so these mutations were waiting for validation based on a larger number of patients with similar phenotypes, and no one had uh, dared to uh, confer them pathogenicity until uh, some functional evidence was present. But this is another example. Uh, this is an initiative of, of Olger Lerche and uh, uh, Wolf in Germany. It has nothing to do with desire, but it's a, a very important model. Everybody knows uh, that SCN2A can cause phenotypes of different severity, but nobody knew what to do with treatment. And then they collecting a very large number of observations with this consortium could uh, differentiate the response based on the type of mutation and clinical presentation to different drugs. So this is not personalized treatment, but certainly is a treatment which is within a framework of much better management of the disorder, which would not, not be known had this study not been undertaken. And then to conclude uh, another study, uh, this is again a desire, but also with uh, other uh, people not belonging to the consortium. Uh, the STAN1 gene, uh, uh, coding for uh, one of the spectrins, had been associated with a very severe progressive encephalopathy and uh, described in Japan in a very few patients. But by collecting a large number of patients, we saw that the phenotype was not just circumscribed to the heterodimerization domain mutations, which caused the most severe phenotype, and the most severe phenotypes usually are described first for different reasons. And then one gets the impression that the syndrome is always severe, like uh, SCN1A for Dravet syndrome. We have 50% of patients who do not have Dravet syndrome. Same for SPLAN1, and uh, while patients with uh, mutations in this domain had a progressive disorder with progressive cerebral atrophy, patients with mutations in other domains had mild epilepsy and sometimes normal IQs, and no evidence at all of progression of the disease. And then to conclude the important area of mosaicism in the brain. This is a major achievement of the genetics of epilepsy, but it's the genetics of brain malformations actually, which prompted these studies. Uh, there are many studies on this now from different teams, Joe Gleason, Chris Walsh, but this study has been quite interesting for us in the epilepsy perspective. This team in uh, Korea uh, identified mTOR mutations in areas of focal dysplasia of the brain, I'm finished, and uh, uh, performed in utero retroporation, and then treated the animals who had developed abnormal cell types and early seizures with rapamycin, and the treatment produced uh, uh, remission of both the uh, abnormalities, cell abnormalities and, and seizures. So it's very a strong a proof of concept for development of drugs in this area. I think I will conclude here because, you know, two hours would not be sufficient to summarize all this data, but uh, I think the message has been thrown. Thank you. So I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who is Dr. Rima Nabu, who is going to be speaking about the emerging role of genetics in the clinical care pathway. Welcome, Rima. Hello, everyone. Thank you. And I'm really happy to be able to present here on behalf of EpiCare. But I should emphasize that I'm also a partner in Desire and Epistop. And I think that being all together here is really very, very important. So basically, I will take my uh, clinician casket and tell you that uh, how this is changing our every day dealing with our patient. And this is very naive slide for the physicians that are here because what we do usually in clinics, we try to settle a diagnosis for a patient 
we look for etiology because even if we have syndromes in epilepsy, we have different etiologies that might, and I showed here a case with focal dysplasia, that might change the treatment that would be in this case that might be surgery. I will not go into surgery and I will focus on genetic non-surgical cases for the rest of my talk. This is one slide that you saw. It's a just to tell you that we should talk today, today about genetics because there is an explosion in our knowledge and it is increasing in a very exponential way. And this is a new proposal for the classification and terminology where we have this uh, slide that shows that for one patient with epilepsy, we should try to define at least the seizure type, then if we can define the epilepsy type, it's very good. And if we can arrive in some cases to syndromes, it's also good, but we cannot do this for all patients. And what is really important, I'm trying to find it, is uh, to have this etiology, uh, I would say, uh, work up and a point that is very, very important, I will get into it at the end of my talk, are the comorbidities, because let's think about epilepsy as a disease where we are not only counting seizures. So, please, if we can have the video. This is just to tell you, this is an old case that we had almost uh, 10 years ago in our institution. She presented, you, you saw the movement that she had, the hypertonia that she showed with her uh, left hand, and you don't have the voice, but she will have very, very acute crying, <coughs> having this the whole time. She was doing over 150 seizures per day, and she was addressed as having an anoxic ischemic problem at birth. And this child, and this is what I wanted to emphasize had during two years and a half of her life, in addition to many intensive care stay, uh, uh, stays, in addition to all the burden of having this, many trials over 20, uh, over 10 uh, anti-epileptic drugs and others. And she had all of these exams. She was here in the hospital every two or three months because we had another test that we thought that should be useful for her. So this is a huge burden, not only from an economical point of view, but it is, but also from the burden for the family and the quality of life. And what we had when we begin to have our exome sequencing, we had a mutation in SCN2A 2 gene that Renzo just talked about. And this patient responded when we put a very good doses and we controlled the doses of sodium blockers. And this is, I will not go into the details of this tiny list, but definitely this case will basically emphasize the importance in the diagnosis because this child didn't present a syndrome, a known epileptic syndrome. She had a type of seizures that were focal recurrent. She didn't have a structural abnormalities. We were able to have to do genetic counseling. She had two sister and brothers who are doing fine and the parents asked for uh, uh, antenatal uh, diagnosis, definitely the impact on health economy, and we will arrive for, and the impact on therapies because we adjusted the treatment. Usually we do not use it classically in these patients, phen phenytoin as a chronic treatment. We use it basically in the intensive care. So I will not stay more on this, but just to tell you that today this is a uh, exome sequencing when it's available and we should try to make it available is very important. And we are, be, we are having more and more studies about the economical impact, how we can decrease the uh, cost of these diseases when we, have, when we do this. This is just to show you some of these syndromes that we know in a clinical onset. And the next slide that is from Helen Cross group is to show you this heterogeneity of the genes that are in each syndrome. So going today looking for one gene, even when we think about it, maybe except for one disease that would be Dravet syndrome, and even it's not true because 
we might have other genes, we should really look for different genes as we do not have this homogeneity. This is EpiCare, this is what we showed you, and we hope that with the work that we are doing on registries, on discussing patients, we will be able to uh, decrease, I would say, the odyssey of these patients trying to have this diagnosis and, this, uh, and to go ahead in this phenotyping, genotyping correlation. And my two last minutes, I will use them just to tell you that in clinical care, research is very important. And including clinicians, especially in these rare epilepsies, is mandatory to go ahead. Renzo talked a bit about how difficult it is. And I will show you only one example to emphasize this point, how the bench to bed uh, translation can be really difficult and where we should think about different maybe methodology and we should basically and mainly think about being together. This is the example of the migrating focal seizures in infancy. 15 years after the description of the disease, the major gene was reported. It was a big potassium channel, KCNT1. It was reported, and this is interesting to emphasize, not in large family, but as we know today, we can have with trios. And what we found in this, and this was a work that we done with the team of Yale, that there is an hyperactivation that is very important with the mutation. And two years after, the Australian team showed that there is a rescue in the lab of this hyperactivation. This is the wild type and this is the mutated, one of the mutated patients, there is a rescue, very clear rescue, with kinidine. And this is the work on repurposing the drugs that we really need in these situations. And so the community, the clinical community, the clinicians community were really very excited about that. And this is only to show you that in these four patients that I'm showing you here, all of them had the mutations that showed a very clear rescue effect of kinidine, but less than half of them had a clinical uh, response. I will not detail this because it is long, but it is to say that it's not a straightforward, it's about many factors. We will listen about some of them later on. And today what we can say that we have some genes that are influencing therapies for in some instances to avoid uh, some treatments in others to give some treatments and the gene influencing treatment that are under study are also some of them. And I will end with two slides saying that it's not only about doing trials, but it's about our thinking in epilepsy and in these early onset epileptic encephalopathies. We, at the moment, we restricted maybe our diagram to this, the epilepsy seizures, EEG, will give a cognitive and behavioral in, in, in input and uh, worsening. And today, today we know with these gene abnormalities that the gene defect will give not only the epileptic activity, but we are in a disease model, and so we should think maybe about to adapt our outcome measures in these patients and not to keep on counting only seizures. This is a slide that Renzo showed you. I don't know if we will arrive to a treatment for each gene, for each mechanism, for each group, but definitely keeping work, working together, we will go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rima. Uh, now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who is Dr. Isia lopez Sendas, who will be speaking on genetic variation in microRNAs and their targets in epilepsy. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here, and I hope I get uh, everything right with the, the controls. Uh, no, that's wrong. <laughs> that's not my talk. <laughs> So I will be presenting to you some preliminary results uh, of work package five uh, of the Epimirna project. 
so uh, our aim is to identify DNA variation across uh, microRNA biosynthesis genes, their targets, and all known microRNAs and determine if rare variants represent risk factors for epilepsy. Uh, we started uh, concentrating on mesial temporal lobe epilepsy with hypocampal sclerosis. However, as the work was uh, developed, we also included the other epilepsy phenotypes. And we we're hoping that at the end of the study, we'll be able to provide a list of potential therapeutic targets for seizure control that could be investigated further. Uh, so that's the description of uh, patients that were included. As you can see, we have a total of 850 patients with mesial temporal lobe epilepsy with hypocampal sclerosis. And I should mention that we spent a lot of time and effort in getting the phenotype right here. So there was uh, really uh, a good clinical uh, characterization of this group of patients across the different centers. We have also uh, collected samples from 750 patients with GGE and non-focal uh, localization-related uh, epilepsy. And uh, we have also uh, been able to assemble uh, 1,600 uh, controls from the different centers. The, uh, this work was uh, performed mainly with uh, next generation sequencing and uh, there was a capturing uh, kit developed specifically for this project, uh, which included uh, uh, 1,500 uh, human microRNA microRNAs, 42 biogenesis uh, genes related to microRNAs, and uh, uh, a number of validated and predicted microRNAs uh, three prime UTR regions. And this, was, this list was construct, constructed by Dr. Martin's uh, laboratory. The sequence was performed in two centers at Unicamp, uh, my institution, and at uh, Columbia University. And uh, we uh, initially planned two types of analysis. Uh, the first one is a collapsing analysis, which uh, is per has been performed by the Colombian team. And uh, it assumes that all variants identified uh, have a major effect in the same direction. So it's a, a sort of a monogenic uh, way of looking at this uh, analysis. And a second approach, which was SCAT-O, performed by our team at Unicamp, that allows different variants to have different directions and magnitude of effects, uh, which points more to a polygenic model of uh, analyzing the data. And after quality control and exclusion of uh, some samples, uh, we performed a, uh, a PCA analysis uh, to look at, at if both samples from Brazil and from the, uh, the US uh, had some population structure. And as you can see, we can show that there is some uh, stratification uh, with the samples. So we decided to go for a meta-analysis instead of combining uh, our uh, information in one single data set. Uh, so for the collapsing analysis, uh, which, uh, as I mentioned, uh, was uh, performed uh, by uh, the team at uh, Columbia using uh, these uh, parameters that were uh, listed here, uh, we have that uh, there were three uh, types of analysis done separately. First, we look at loss of function coding variants in microRNA biogenesis genes. Second, uh, they look at uh, microRNA hairpins. And third, uh, variants in target three prime UTR, UTR regions. And uh, unfortunately, uh, no single uh, uh, target uh, resisted to the Bonferroni uh, correction. However, uh, when we separate it by uh, phenotypes, you can see that, if I can get the pointer to work, you can see that there is an excess of rare variation in the known, uh, uh, in the known uh, uh, localized related focal epilepsies, uh, and that for uh, our, uh, our microRNA synthesis genes, target regions uh, containing known uh, dominant epilepsy genes, and the remaining uh, target regions. 
Uh, for the SCAT O uh, analysis that uh, we are performing at Unicamp, I'm going to show you some preliminary results uh, since we have not uh, finished yet uh, uh, the analysis. And uh, we, we uh, can see that uh, uh, we also divided in the three types of analysis as uh, the, the previous uh, group did uh, at Columbia. And unfortunately, again, no single microRNA uh, resisted to the Bonferroni corrections. However, there is always a however. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, we, in the past two weeks, uh, we have uh, uh, performed an additional study uh, using uh, data from uh, expression analysis in different uh, tissue. Uh, from the giant uh, project, and we could see that when we look at uh, genes that are expressed in hippocampus, uh, hippocampus and temporal lobe epilepsy, and were not expressed in the other regions, and especially for the mesial temporal lobe epilepsy uh, cases, uh, we can see, uh, we started to see some uh, candidates popping up. Uh, we don't have the analysis for this algorithm in the complete set, uh, so uh, we are uh, cautiously optimistic that uh, uh, we will be able to in, uh, improve these results by adding uh, the remaining of the data set. And in conclusion, uh, although no single gene uh, uh, resisted to the Bonferroni corrections, we could see that the SCAT O analysis uh, shows some promising results uh, by incorporating this stratification uh, by uh, different expressed genes in the, in the central nervous system. And we also could see that the collapsing analysis show an excess of rare variants in a subtype of epilepsy. So the major challenges are uh, that uh, we could not use both uh, samples from the different locations as one single data set because of population stratification. And uh, we uh, hope, hopefully, we will be replicate the SCAT O analysis in the Columbia sample independently because they do have a large number of controls which are very important for this type of analysis. And, uh, but we have to assume that we may not be able to have significant results because of limitation in sample size. And uh, I would like to acknowledge the participation of uh, many people in different institutions and in different parts of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Isia. So I will be speaking uh, next on uh, genetic studies in the EpiStop project. And if they can put up my first slide. Yes, there we go. So um, let's go ahead to the second slide. So um, this study is, I think, somewhat different from any of the other studies that have been discussed today in that this is entirely focused on one particular type of epilepsy that associated with tuberous sclerosis complex. And just to review for you, uh, the few in the audience who are not familiar, this is a monogenic disorder in which mutations in either TSE1 or TSE2 occur and cause this complex syndrome called tuberous sclerosis complex where there are many manifestations in different parts of the body. Uh, and of course, uh, during the uh, early infancy, the major manifestation is that related to the brain uh, with seizures, cognitive delay, autism, and other features that will be talked about uh, later during this meeting. Um, so, and the goal of the study was to do a prospective study in which uh, infants would be diagnosed less than age three months uh, and would be en enrolled in the study and then be followed with a number of monitoring um, uh, techniques, um, including EEG analysis, as Levin has already um, uh, described, uh, and that infants that appear to be uh, close to developing full-blown seizures were showing evidence of epileptogenesis occurring, but that'd be randomized to treatment with either vigabatrin or um, placebo to see if there was therapeutic benefit. So that was the randomized part of this trial, but the other major part of the trial was to analyze a, a large number of um, biomarkers, basically everything that we could think of, uh, that we could assess 
prospectively in these infants developing into small children uh, to see if we could identify other biomarkers that were currently unknown that would uh, predict seizure development and perhaps response to seizures. And so, as indicated on this slide, um, we actually collected material from three different time points during the life of each of these children with TSC um, at study entry, um, if they developed signs of epilepsy, and then onset of seizures, and then age two years. And on each of those four samples, we did the studies that are listed here, RNA sequencing, proteomic profiling, et cetera. And in addition, we've done whole genome sequencing on all subjects and uh, also comprehensive and deep TSC1 and TSC2 mutation analysis. So in fact, as I say in red on the slide, I believe these children will be subject to the most detailed molecular characterization in human history. Um, I don't know if another population was being studied in this fashion. So that's um, certainly impressive. Um, so a, I don't have time to talk about all these studies at this point, uh, since I have only eight minutes, like all the other speakers. Uh, and B, many of these are not completed yet because this was a prospective trial. Subjects were enrolled, they were filed out through two years. It took about two years of accrual to get up to our target of 100. And so the, the final samples are just being collected, and so most of these analyses are not completed at this point in time. So what I'm going to focus on today is the mutation findings in TSC1 and TSC2 and some preliminary data on uh, correlations with uh, outcome in these individuals. Um, so um, this is an area that I've um, been working in for many years. And so, um, and, and just a little bit more background, again, for those of you who may not be aware that um, TSC in most cases is a sporadic disorder, so there's no family history. So we and many others have shown these are due to mut new mutations that occur. And also um, this phenomenon of mosaicism is relatively common in TSC, in which um, the mutation in the gene is not present in all of the cells in that individual, but rather are present in some proportion of the cells in that individual. And so as shown on this slide, um, the results of this analysis on 98 subjects, which were the ones that stayed in the study and met diagnostic criteria for TSC are shown here. And you can see that the majority had a mutation identified in TSC2, about a quarter had a mutation identified in TSC1, and there were five subjects in whom to date we have not been able to identify a mutation. We call those NMI, which is short for no mutation identified. Uh, the middle uh, pie chart shows that these fell into kind of the usual pattern for mutations that we see in TSC1 and TSC2 with nonsense, missense, splice, and deletions each contributing a significant fraction and then smaller fractions for other types, uh, including some large genomic deletions. Uh, and then, uh, somewhat surprising to me, but was a finding, was that, um, in fact, a, a significant proportion, eight of these 98 uh, children, actually did display mosaicism for a mutation in TSC1 or TSC2, and that's shown on the far right here. And so this shows this in greater detail, showing the mosaic allele frequencies on the chart at right, uh, and showing the actual mutations, a couple of which were these large genomic deletions shown at the left for those of you who are interested. And kind of the most striking thing to me was that there were three children in whom the mosaic allele frequency was less than 5%, really very low. Uh, and, and again, these were based upon analysis of blood samples, so this is blood DNA that we were analyzing. We did not have access to brain tissue in any of these infants for, for analysis, of course. So again, just showing that even with infants who are diagnosed with TSC, that mosaicism is relatively common, seen here in about 8%. Okay, so then uh, looking at the comparison between these genetic findings, I've got two minutes left already. <laughs> looking at the comparison with um, clinical features in these children uh, with the genetic findings that is shown on this slide. Um, and here you can see that, so, so I've tried to graph here both the percentage of subjects that have a particular feature and the p-value that is associated with this. And so what you can see is that among those five subjects in whom we did not find any mutation, the NMI set, none of those developed epilepsy during the two-year period of follow-up. 
among those that were mosaic, this was also seen to be reduced, was 38% um, compared to nearly uh, two-thirds in those that had a full heterozygous mutation. And this was very statistically, highly statistically significant. This red line is drawn at a log, a minus 10 uh, p-value of 1.3, indicating statistical significance if it's above that. And this was also show associated with tubers um, uh, appearing on scan in these individuals diagnosed with, uh, these children, infants diagnosed with TSC. Again, no tubers were seen in the NMI group and a somewhat lesser proportion was seen in the mosaic patients. Um, uh, also true for subependymal nodules, another classic feature of TSC, uh, not seen for hypomelanotic macules and sort of close to significance for rhabdomyomas. Um, and then uh, looking at this at a later time point, at 24 months of age, um, again, the, there was, this is the same uh, data from the previous slide, but looking at hypomelanotic macules, tubers, subependymal nodules, and rhabdomyomas, if they're present at age 24 months, again, there was a gradient of expression such that this was higher in patients that had a full heterozygous mutation in TSC1 or TSC2 in comparison with mosaic or the five NMI subjects. So um, suggesting that if one did genetic analysis early on in subjects with TSE in infants, that one could use this as prognosticating information in terms of seizure development. Um, and then um, finally, I'm, I'm embarrassed as the session chair to be running over the time, but I will go quickly. Um, so uh, then I, we've also looked at the incidence of TSE1 or TSE2 full heterozygote mutations, um, and this is actually the most important part of this, where in fact there was a highly statistically significant difference in seizure development in children who had TSC2 versus TSC1. It's shown a little bit more clearly over here. It was only a 30% incidence among the approximately 25 subjects who had a TSC1 mutation, and was nearly 80% for those who had a TSC2 mutation. So again, these are findings from genetic analysis. All the other studies which are ongoing in terms of looking at microRNA, et cetera, RNA sequencing on peripheral blood, our intention is to integrate those all together to try to come up with the best prognostic model we can for seizure development in TSC. And finally, we hope that these findings will also have relevance to other seizure disorders occurring in children with other types of seizures where these same prognostic factors may be relevant. I'll stop there. Who is Albert Becker, who will be speaking from the EpiTarget Consortium on functional epigenomic dissection of epilepsy in human brain biopsy tissue and corresponding mouse models. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, David, uh, for this introduction and the opportunity um, to present some of our data and concepts here. And um, to give you the background, actually, we are uh, interested in um, uh, genetic epilepsies and, and also acquired focal epilepsies, um, since those can affect identical target molecules and uh, the architecture of the promoter and dynamic regulation of promoters is really important in uh, uh, both uh, disease con uh, contexts. Um, so uh, on the one side, we are interested in mutational channelopathies, which are rare uh, deleterious gene mutations, um, which act actually together with common polygenetic, uh, polygenic uh, variation and causal SNPs in promoters uh, may um, uh, play uh, a substantial role there. On the other hand, the same molecules can be affected by transcriptional channelopathies here, and this is that uh, dynamic regulation of the promoter can lead to altered expression of uh, respective genes after transient brain insults, such as uh, status epilepticus, and this can uh, uh, be the basis of a hyperexcitable mostly hippocampal network, actually. And uh, during um, my presentation, I would like to concentrate on an example, and that is um, a voltage-dependent calcium channel, uh, CAV 3.2, and um, it was shown by a series um, of um, 
uh, publications uh, uh, from, from us and also other groups that there is a transient transcriptional and also translational increase of uh, this uh, voltage dependent calcium channel subunit after status epilepticus, that there uh, is um, uh, following an increased density of uh, voltage dependent uh, T type calcium currents and uh, there is an augmented propensity for burst discharges and this was shown by Yuelyari and Heinz Beck what you see here uh, these are experiments in uh, slices with sharp microelectrodes that in contrast to normal single action potential um, uh, here of CA1 neurons after status epilepticus you see that after uh, uh, short and long depolarization here that there are bursts of action potential so a very strong increase of um, uh, the signal here and that a high number, almost 60% uh, of C1 neurons convert into this bursting mode. And um, we finally showed that actually in CV3.2 uh, knockout animals after status epilepticus induced by pilocarpine, um, you see that uh, the number and frequency of chronic recurrent epileptic seizures is dramatically uh, reduced here. The question was then what actually controls this increase, this transcriptional increase here of CV3.2 after status epilepticus on the promoter level and um, we characterized this promoter here, Karen van Loo from our group did that and looked at conservation between different species uh, particularly and uh, she could show that there is uh, a minimal promoter here around 1,400 uh, base pairs, which is strongly active per se here, uh, which is upstream of the ATG here. And um, she could also show that there are differences um, in um, repressing NRSF elements actually and also activating elements, uh, especially um, this accumulation of uh, binding sites for uh, a zinc inducible transcription factor MTF1. And we were really interested in that because there is a strong increase of free and also intracellular zinc um, after a status epilepticus. And uh, by a series of experiments I'm not going to show you, um, we, we found that there is in fact active binding of MTF1 here um, um, in the promoter after status epilepticus. And um, we then, um, actually together with Susanne Schoch, uh, we uh, did an experiment where um, um, we implanted transmitters and also stereotactically infused an MTF1 dominant negative um, uh, adeno associated virus in the hippocampal formation, then induced status epilepticus and carried out seizure monitoring. And what you can see here is again that the animals that received this dominant negative uh, MTF1 uh, variant had a significantly lower seizure frequency than control animals. So. Um, do we find evidence that this is uh, operational also in the human disease context? We looked here at patients, a large uh, series of patients, um, that after status epilepticus, like this patient you see here, uh, the picture is not good unfortunately, but here's hippocampal sclerosis after uh, a couple of weeks here. Uh, so patients that really have evidence of epileptogenesis uh, after status epilepticus, and when you look um, into uh, um, uh, actually mRNA expression patterns of those uh, patients after epilepsy surgery, then you see a very strong positive correlation between expression of MTF1 and CV3.2. So this holds true for acquired epilepsies. So now con more conceptually actually, if uh, we think of um, genet uh, genetically generalized epilepsies as most uh, common form actually of genetically genetically determined epilepsies, there is a high uh, heritability with a strong polygenic component and um, uh, common genetic variants explain around more than 30% and mainly um, there are non-coding variants involved that may affect uh, gene expression and uh, there is an increased discovery of recessive epilepsy genes by compound heterozygosity screening and as I said before, Rarely we find loss and gain of function mutations in respective patients, but in comparison with more frequent and common EQTLs, 
um, in which regulatory SNP variants can impact low or high expression of corresponding genes and uh, uh, ME, so methylation, QTLs that uh, affect the uh, different uh, differential methylation of respective uh, promoters. And uh, potentially, so these common variants can aggravate the haploid insufficiency uh, rendered by rare variants. So, um, so with respect to CV3.2, actually there are rare mutational channelopathies here uh, in idiopathic generalized epilepsies that have generally mild functional changes uh, which uh, increase the channel function. And um, we are interested actually, um, and this was based on a promoter in silico analysis where we had uh, um, a, a very uh, vivid collaboration actually with a group of um, Michael Johnson um, from the EpiTarget consortium. And um, so, so what, what we think is really interesting is particularly this SNP here which uh, affects the binding uh, affinity here of MTF1, so normally uh, a rather strong uh, binding affinity uh, given by this uh, uh, software here, and this is dramatically uh, decreased by this minor allele, and this is located here in a big, uh, a large CPG island spanning large parts of this promoter here. So um, what's, I'm, I'm more or less done. So what uh, we then do is um, stratify brain samples here according to regulatory SNP genotypes, the methylation state of the CPG island and clinical parameters, and uh, analyze the effect on uh, corresponding uh, gene expression. In parallel, we use neutral electroporation uh, animal models here and uh, introduce this CV3.2 promoter variants with uh, uh, the different genotypes to control the expression of a reporter. And then we use in vivo molecular imaging, as you see here, in order to look at the activity of this promoter under different conditions, under epileptic conditions at uh, uh, different age ranges. So these are actually living, living mice here in which you can monitor the activity of this promoter. So just very briefly to sum up, I think that this epigenomic profiling um, uh, gives us the opportunity to learn about the role of causal uh, uh, regulatory SNPs and their function role also in epileptogenesis. They may aggravate uh, the haploid insufficiency of uh, loss and gain of function uh, mutations uh, actually, and we think that we will learn by this uh, about novel epilepsy genes and also expand the mutation spectrum um, uh, by these variants. And uh, of course, these regulatory SNPs may have an impact on the threshold for epileptogenesis. Uh, and we may also learn from this, actually, um, since this human epileptic tissue gives us insight on gene uh, expression, uh, more in general, also about um, uh, other neuropsychiatric disorders. So that was my talk. I thank you for your attention. Okay, we have 10, maybe 12 minutes for discussion. I'd like to ask all the speakers to come up to facilitate this so that you can stand here in front and that will make it easier for people who ask questions. So do we have a starting question? Yes, Jean-Pierre. Jean Great. The, the, uh, the mosaic patients where you said as low as 5% was sufficient, have those specific mutations been observed in other patients with TS? Uh, for the most part, I can't sort of confirm that for every single one, but these are common mutations that are, I mean, they're all inactivating in one way or another, either nonsense or out of frame indels or large deletions. So, so then do you think it's just a higher percentage in brain tissue? Like, because my logic would be if 5% is enough if we take that as a percentage of the body as a whole, I know that's an assumption. Yeah. If you had 100%, the phenotype would be a lot worse. Yes, I think that's true, and I think that's why the phenotype is milder, why they're not developing epilepsy. Um, as you know, the, it's really unpredictable what the level of mosaicism is in other tissues, and it could be quite variable. You know, most of these infants are being diagnosed based upon skin manifestations and cardiac rhabdomyoma. 
So those are sort of the two sites where we could infer there'd have to be enough representation that they get those lesions so that they come to diagnosis. Um, but um, so it's, you know, it, it's something where I'd love to study this, but it's, it's difficult to do to get samples. We actually are doing a study not in the, the epistop population where we're looking at mosaicism in greater detail to see where is it higher, where is it lower, what's the variation that you see. And what about parental mosaicism? Was there any there? And if there was, was there subtle phenotype in any of the parents or mosaic? Um, there were some familial cases in this series, but I don't know for the epistop population if there was a hint of mosaicism. Of course, the children would inherit the full heterozygote mutation in that circumstance. Thanks. Other questions? Sorry, quieting down now. A few of you uh, to the targeting drugs according to mutations, and, and as you will know, I'm not clinical, but has that information been tabulated in any form? Have there been surveys? And is there a option for those of us who don't deal with patients to, to, to have you know, some kind of quantification of, is this rumor, is it anecdote, or are these things hard and fast now? I didn't understand the whole question. So, 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 so do you mean that that we look to 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 look at the um, the the the, uh, the amount of the effect of the mutation and then correlate it to to the clinical response, or uh, more more sort of tabulating how many people have now observed that Fentoyan worsens seizures in ah, Drave? Okay. How many people have tabulated the quinidine? Is there a database where that kind of information is collected? No, no, we are just collecting this on a single basis, yeah? So people that are working on KCNT1 are doing that. Uh, there has been even a study published with KCNT1, yeah? So um, with KCNA2, we are the center that are, is collecting all the information and, and we are putting together a first manuscript probably with, with just these pilot trials and then, then try to make a, a kind of a little bit bigger trial. It's not me possible to make a big randomized trial, yeah, so, so we have to find intelligent designs, how we can find this to compare with natural history or maybe to uh, one design that I have in mind is to, to stop the drug. Um, we, we just have to control for seizures if people have really seizures, but not all of them have seizures. So, so to just look at the ataxia, at the speech development and things like that. So, so there are a few things in our mindset how, how we can deal with that. Well, it is, it's very difficult because uh, there are ethical obstacles to provide this. For example, the first evidence of a systematic worsening to a specific drug was with Dravé syndrome, which, which we published, I think, in the 90s. And that was a retrospective study because there was such a large, after the dr this drug became available because of the limited side effects in terms of sedative side effects, was widely used. So within a short time, a uh, sufficiently large number of observations were collected, and it was easy to see that the drug had been withdrawn because there were so many patients who had withdrawn, uh, worse than, sorry. But ethically, it's very difficult, as, uh, as Olger mentioned. I just wanted to add that this would be one of the major advances from registries and prospective natural history registries. I, I, I'm looking at Levin and Helen and the whole Epicare group, mainly for the rare epilepsies. And we are trying with the American uh, ER, REN, also Rare Epilepsy Network, to, to work on this. This is number one. And the uh, second point is that it's very difficult. We do not have something like the gene matcher or whatever database where we can put this. Renzo talked very nicely how they found their mutation in the APV gene, how they found different patients. And this is, is really lacking except for some uh, patient groups registries and patient groups are really very keen to this and working with the oh. networks. Just one more time, point that I forgot to mention in my talk. Um, uh, it was mentioned this morning that cohorts will be funded again. I mean, this is so important. And uh, one important 
um, fact about EpiPGX is as well, we phenotyped for three to four years before we could start any type of genetic research. Yeah? So the phenotype is much more in, uh, much more expensive um, than the genotype nowadays. And, 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 and it's so important to learn something about it. So, so to have better cohorts, to have really good registries is a very, very important um, uh, feature for, for, for the next decade, I would say. Excellent work overall. Um, I, I want to hear your thoughts on, on the biggest issue that we have in clinical trials for patients with rare epilepsies. Uh, all these data are great, but the question is how is this going to generalize to a larger population even within the same uh, diagnosis? Um, so what are your thoughts and also other trials. endpoints? We, we, other we, have, we have one trial which, which is shortly starting about uh, phenytoin in neonatal epilepsies. Um, KCNT1 trial has been published. Um, we are designing another trial, as, as I said, for KCNT2. So I think it's, it's going on. There's this trial that has been published on tuberosa sclerosis uh, with Everolimus. Yeah, so, uh, so I think it's, it, it's in the minds. And um, it's important that you mention it, but, but I think it's uh, everywhere. Yeah. And a follow-up question. Is it possible to combine all this with a pathway analysis in order to draw a larger uh, group of uh, subjects? Because Ultimately, it's going to have to generalize somehow. Otherwise, we're repurposing drugs for a very small number of patients, which is... We have to know the pathways. Right. So another question back. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for a fantastic series of questions. Um, so, so far, with re repurposing and precision therapeutics, most of the successes have been in iron channel genes with gain-of-function mutations. So what do you see as the prospects for precision therapeutics in non-iron channel genes with loss of function mutations, which are the predominant class of mutation in the severe early onset epilepsies. Sorry, I'm talking all the time, but I just thought about it while writing another grant. Um, so this is uh, definitely um, something which I think is not so, I mean, we, we have a lot of drugs that are working on iron channels. That's the reason why we find such drugs and why these drugs are in our mind as researchers. Uh, but I think what we have to develop is um, a kind of, of, of uh, uh, data and literature mining where we can find drugs for specific targets, for specific uh, pathways maybe even, yeah? and, and maybe this has to be created in a much more uh, effective way um, that we can, can search for those drugs. So if we have a pathway identified, um, then, then, then we can ha have a look in the databases what is uh, available um, on FDA-approved drugs. Um, there is a lot, yeah, as, as you all know, and um, I, I think this way is also possible in other diseases. We just don't know that much about it than with iron channels. Any other questions? Are you thinking, Michael, are you thinking of a special subcategory of etiologies or is in general non-ion channels? I'd just like to emphasize that even within a pathway, you know, there are nuances that are very important. For example, in the mTOR pathway, the PROS syndrome that some of you may be familiar with that's due to activating mutations in PIK3CA, that is unresponsive to mTOR inhibitors. Um, you know, so it depends at exactly what level of activation you are, whether or not those agents might be helpful. I think we're done. <laughs> <laughs>